laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and we light the candle of joy. And the psalmist wrote, It seemed like a dream, too good to be true, when God returned Zion's exiles. We laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives, so those who planted their crops in despair will shout hoorays at the harvest, so those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessings. And in the book of Thessalonians, we find these words. And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. Get along among yourselves, each of you doing your part. Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on, gently encourage the stragglers, and reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs, and be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other, and always do your best to bring it out. Be cheerful, no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you to belong to Christ Jesus to live. Don't suppress the Spirit, and don't stifle those who have a word from the Master. On the other hand, don't be gullible. Check out everything and keep only what's good. Throw out anything tainted with evil. When was the last time you found it difficult to contain your joy? What did it feel like in your body and soul to be so joyful? First Thessalonians reminds us that rejoicing and prayer come when we are at peace in our communities when we are encouraging the faint-hearted, when we are helping the weak and being patient with everyone. What opportunities do you have to help others to be a peacemaker and offer encouragement in this season? Rejoice, rejoice. 
Uh, so we will be recording uh, Christmas Eve service um, that might be very similar to our Sunday service, might be a little bit different, still in the planning stages, but uh, that will be up uh, early on Christmas Eve for you to tune in anytime you want to, uh, then or after that, Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, Christmas day, whatever, uh, whatever works for you, we will, we will endeavor to be there for you. Uh, I believe that's all the announcements that I have for today. Um, would you join me in prayer? Holy and loving God, today we bow before you, acknowledging you as our God, the one who created us, the one who knows us, knows our needs, knows our joys, knows our fears, and knows our bliss. We are thankful for all the love that you show us. You bless our lives beyond anything we could measure. Even in these times that are difficult, you can draw us close to you to give us encouragement and to give us hope. All too often, Lord, we see too much of the things that we want and acknowledge too little of the things that we have. Forgive us for those times when we are centered on self and not on you. Forgive us when we turn a deaf ear to those in need. Help us to stay mindful of the commandment to love you and love our neighbors. We pray once again for all those who are ill. For those who have been attacked by the coronavirus and for all those everywhere who are needing medical attention for whatever reason. We pray for those who sacrifice their time and safety for the well-being of others, for doctors, nurses, technicians, and support staff who are past the point of fatigue and weariness. Undergird them with your strength and encouragement. Bless all those who are at risk just helping us cope with day-to-day -day life. Thank you for those whose hard work have led them to vaccines to prevent the further spread of this horrible disease. And Lord, help us, help us to get better. Help us, Lord, our, our plaintive cries to help us to get back to church. And Lord, we lift these concerns to you. We lift these joys to you. We lift this prayer to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the one who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. see what the psalmist has for us today. I'll be reading to you from the 121st Psalm. Psalm 121. I raise my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God won't let your foot slip. Your protector won't fall asleep on the job. No, Israel's protector never sleeps or rests. The Lord is your protector. The Lord is your shade right beside you. The sun won't strike you during the day. Neither will the moon at night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. God will protect your very life. The Lord will protect you on your journeys, whether going or coming, from now until forever. From now. Amen. Let us, let us reaffirm our faith together, reminding ourselves what we believe by reciting our traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty.
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. a source of hope for the world. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning is taken from the prophet Isaiah. I'll be reading from the 61st chapter, verses 1 to 4 and 8 to 11. Isaiah 61, 1 to 4 and 8 to 11. The Lord God's Spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release for the captives and liberation for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. They will recall, they will be recalled, oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord to glorify himself. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places, and they will renew ruined cities, places deserted in generations past. I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and dishonesty. I will faithfully give them their wage and make with them an enduring covenant. Their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people blessed by the Lord. I surely rejoice in the Lord. My heart is joyful because of my God, because he has clothed me with clothes of victory wrapped me in a robe of righteousness, like a bridegroom in a priestly crown, and like a bride adorned in jewelry. As the earth puts out its growth, and as a garden grows its seeds, so the Lord God will grow righteousness and praise before all nations. Our epistle lesson this morning is taken from the Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. I'll be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 24. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 24. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Don't suppress the Spirit. Don't brush off Spirit-inspired messages, but examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. Avoid every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at our Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his holy written word. Our gospel text this morning is taken from the gospel according to John. And I'll be reading from the first chapter, verses 6 to 8, and 19 through 28. John 1, 6 to 8, and 19 through 28. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. Skipping down to verse 19. Of course, we skip two pages. This is John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? John confessed. He didn't deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? John said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? John answered, No. They asked, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. Make the Lord's path straight, just as the prophet Isaiah said. Those sent by the Pharisees asked, Why do you baptize if you aren't the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water. Someone greater stands among you whom you don't recognize. He comes after me, but I'm not worthy to untie his sandal straps. This encounter took place across the Jordan in Bethany, where John was baptizing. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words that I speak in this moment and the thoughts and feelings that we think and experience just now, may they all be acceptable in your sight. And may all, they all continue to teach us of your great love for us. And may they inspire us, Lord, to want to live for you. In Christ we pray. John's Gospel, we read the familiar words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything that came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. Later on, a few verses after our text today, we read, The Word became flesh, and made his home. <coughs> and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Now in the middle of these messages, we have the introduction of John sent from God as a witness to testify to the truth of Christ, being at first with God in creation, and then as the Son of God in human form, the source of our salvation. In essence, then, we can see John, John the Baptist, being a bridge between God the Creator and Christ the Redeemer. 
And when John was pressured by the Jewish leaders of his day to tell them who he was, he was very quick and much more adamant to tell them who he wasn't. The priests and the Levites, that would have been the clergy and the lay leaders of the temple, asked plainly, who are you? And the first thing he told them was, I am not the Christ. Now, a word of emphasis, a word of explanation is warranted here. The word of Greek uh, origin, Christ, and the word of Hebrew origin, Messiah, mean the same thing. The one who is especially anointed by God for the purpose of saving the people. For centuries, the Jewish people had been waiting for the Messiah to come and to save them and to restore the nation of Israel to the power and glory that it had under the rule of King David hundreds of years before. Since John had been baptizing people and had been preaching a message of repentance, the Jewish leaders were questioning who John was and by what authority was he doing these things. They asked him, Are you Elijah? Back in the day of the Jewish prophet Malachi, he advised the people, Look, I am sending... Elijah the prophet to you before the great and terrifying day of the Lord arrives. Now in Mark, Jesus certainly identifies John the Baptist as the one who came in the role of Elijah as his forerunner. But John truly stated to his inquisitors he was not Elijah. They persisted, are you the prophet? The Jewish leaders were referring to a prophet in the tradition of Moses from the Old Testament. And again, John answered, no. John was much more ready to say who he wasn't than who he was. He was stepping back because his subject, his emphasis, was not on himself, but on the one who was following him, Jesus. But when pressed by his interrogators, who he was, and what did he have to say about himself, he quoted scripture from the prophet Isaiah. It was, a, it was a quotation which said, These priests and Levites would have all been familiar. He said the words, I am a voice crying out in the wilderness. Make the Lord's path straight. Still questioning his practice of baptizing, they asked him, Why do you baptize if you are not Christ or Elijah or the prophet? And John was quick to reply, that he only baptized with water. There was one coming who was much more worthy, had much more authority. John was directing his attention away from himself and to Jesus the Christ. Now perhaps a brief lesson in baptism is in order. Baptism, the rite of baptism, and that's R-I-T-E of baptism, did not originate with Christians. It was a Jewish observance. A people could become Jews if they were not, if they had not been born into the Jewish tribes, into one of the Jewish families. If they learned about one God, and if they desired to become a Jew, they would first be called God-fearers. Then, if they sincerely wanted to commit themselves to obeying the commandments and observing the festivals and traditions, they could be baptized in water, symbolically being cleared cleanse of the sins of the world, then they would be considered Jews. John the Baptist acknowledged that over time there were many who had been born into the Jewish nation, into the Jewish family, but had gotten away from the commandments and the traditions. There were those who had come to believe that they were God's people even if they failed to keep God's commandments, especially about loving God and loving neighbor. John called on them to change their attitudes and change their lives and be baptized to symbolically be cleansed of the waywardness that they had uh, attained. It was a baptism of repentance. Now, if you've witnessed a Christian baptism, a ceremony where a child or an adult is baptized, you've seen something still different. From a Christian perspective, the Jewish rite of baptism and John's baptism of repentance were both practiced before the death and resurrection of Jesus. Today, if you listen to a pastor baptizing, 
you will hear him or her say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has already sacrificed himself as payment for our sins. Today, our baptism is a sacrament. That is a uh, practice that was ordained by Jesus, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Receiving baptism by water, whether by immersion or pouring or sprinkling, is a sign that you receive the gift of the salvation that God has given you through the sacrifice of Jesus. Now perhaps the most important lesson about John is that he was directing attention away from himself to Jesus, who would come to pay the ultimate atoning sacrifice for our sins. I've often said that these stories from the Bible are not just history lessons. They are implications. In fact, they are directions for how we are to conduct our lives. Are we not like John to direct attention away from our own lives to Jesus, who is the hope of salvation for everyone in the world? Should we not, at every opportunity, give witness to what Christ can do for people? But don't we always shy away from our one-on-one -on -one evangelism, uh, bringing somebody to Jesus Christ? So often we like to say, I don't have the gift. Listen to the wisdom of Mark Middleburg. He's the director of evangelism at Willow Creek Community Church, a church near Chicago. And he said, God knew what he was doing when he made you. He custom designed you for your unique combination of personality, temperament, talents, and background. And he wants to use you to reach others in a fashion that fits your design. For example, says Middleburg, consider these six people from the New Testament. Peter. Peter had a confrontational approach. He was direct, bold, and to the point. He put it in your face. Paul's intellectual approach he could be confrontational, but he was a well-educated man who could reason from the scriptures, explaining and providing that Jesus was the Christ. Then there was the blind man. He had a testimonial approach. The man in John 9 did not know a great deal of theology, but he could say, one thing I know, I once was blind, and now I see. Then there was the Samaritan woman's invitational approach. Leaving her water jug at the well, the woman in John 4 went to her village and invited her friends to come and hear the man who told me everything I did. There was Matthew's interpersonal approach. In Luke 5, 29, Matthew put on a big banquet for his tax-collecting buddies in an effort to expose them to Jesus. He relied on the relationships he built with these men and sought to further shore up their relationship inviting them into his home and using his channels of friendship for evangelism. Then there was Dorcas. She had a service approach. In Acts 9, we meet a woman who witnessed by serving others in Jesus' name, making clothes for the needy and helping the poor. Now, just like these people from the Bible, and they all had different types of personality, different interests, different abilities, Yes, different gifts. You have your own personality, your own interests, your own abilities. And yes, you have your own gifts. All you must do is to be willing to let God use all that is in you to bring people to Jesus Christ. As you prepare for Christmas, prepare for your mission that God will give you the right attitude and the right motivation to help others. See Jesus Christ. Amen.
receive this benediction. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, anointing us to bring hope to all people. Go and prepare the way of the Lord of love. 